Hey guys, and welcome back to the Capoeira Connection podcast, episode number three. Today we sit down with Contramastery Gringo of Capoeira Luanda in Houston, Texas, also founder of the Brazilian Arts Foundation. Um, this is a very interesting podcast and was uh, one that had been on my mind for quite some time. Uh, Contra Mestre Gringo is somebody who I've shared a very um, parallel timeline in Capoeira with. And so it was really fun to kind of sit down and go back over the years with him and, and, and talk a lot about his history of Capoeira, setting up the foundation, his connection with Mestre Jalon, uh, and this kind of stuff. So we're excited to share this with you and we hope you enjoy. What I'm interested in to know right now before we go back to kind of like your like your history in Capoeira and how you started and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, I'm really interested to hear uh, about the organization and the foundation that you have running right now. Mm -hmm. And in November, when, uh, when you invited me to the event and I came out, I was blown away by your, your new location. I had never been there. Mm. You guys have that beautiful deck outside and you walk in and it's like, I mean, it almost reminded me of <clears throat> like a community center. You know, you guys had like a place, you have a kitchen, everybody's like cooking and eating. Mm -hmm. You have an office, you go back, you have a place to train. It's amazing. So just kind of like run us through a little bit about your daily operation and the, and the location, your classes and, and what you have going on there. I mean, you, you hit the, the point, you know, it is a community center. We wanted to be one. We want it to be a place where people feel welcome, feeling home, you know, a place where they want to come back, a place where everybody is accepted and appreciated for who they are and what they bring. You know, daily operations is office work, a lot of office work. What's the, what's the name of the, the foundation? Brazilian Arts Foundation. Brazilian Arts Foundation. And you guys run other... Uh, I mean, I guess the main the main component to that is like the capoeira. Is that kind of what drives the foundation? It is this. It is always going to be the source of energy for me personally, and it was the the first program. So it was the seed mm -hmm. of what it is today and where it's going. Yeah, you know. But the Portuguese program is a strong program for us too. What's your What's your Portuguese program? Oh, uh, we, we teach Portuguese um, three, four times a week. Oh, wow! And um, we have a we had a kids program for a while too, but the demand wasn't there. Yeah, and uh, we do a lot of private classes with kids. Okay, some kids that take up with it, that take the Portuguese. Do you guys bring in um, like Portuguese instructors, or is it you guys who are mm -hmm. doing the? No, we teaching? we hire a Portuguese teacher. Oh there. wow! You know, it's a, it, she's not full time, but she's right. contracted by right. the organization to mm -hmm. run the program, right? To teach the classes and to build the curriculum and all that good stuff. I mean, we is is a team effort, right? Yeah. We serve mainly. You know, it's a lot of people that have a spouse mm -hmm. that is Brazilian. Some people take f because of their profession or their business. Um, it's great because it's a component that adds to the mission of the organization, which is to build the community through the sharing and the preservation of the Brazilian culture. Mm -hmm. So anything that's related to the culture is really important for us to keep that mission alive, you know, and then the language is vital for people to understand the culture and learn about him to be educated about the culture, mm -hmm. right, it's through the language. And it goes right along with the Capoeira program because of the language, you know, so yeah. it, it works. How uh, how long have you guys had your, your foundation open? And I don't mean the location you're at, mm -hmm. I mean the name of the foundation. Yeah, we incorporated in 2001. 2001, wow, yeah. so going on 16, 16 mm -hmm. 17 years. That's incredible. Uh, and what all, what other faucets do you guys kind of have that, uh, that you cycle through your, your organization? So you have the Capoeira classes, you have Portuguese classes, mm -hmm. um, which that's really neat because that's something open to people outside of the realm of Capoeira too. Completely. Yeah. Right. Is, is, uh, and then you guys have, you have any dance or music classes? Yeah, we have, uh, 
Somebody got Fiera in Fall Hall right now. Okay. So we, they both partner dance. Uh, those two classes I'm teaching. And from time to time, we bring people for workshops, just like the Capoeira. Right. right. Last year, not last year, it was still in 2017. <laughs> in June, we did the event that we've been doing for a few years, which is the Music and Dance Conference, when we brought the teachers. The I take classes in Brazil. Oh, okay. Right. One thing important that I don't want to forget to say or drifted to something else about the organization. Master Jalon was the person that advised me to open the nonprofit. To okay. Start the nonprofit. You know, mm-hmm. um, I share with him my desires and what I want to do once I start teaching more and, and going deeper into making up with my profession. Right. And he advised me to, you know, it would be a good idea for you to open yeah. a nonprofit, you know, and that's what clicked for me. Yeah, let me check yeah. what that would entitle to do, what I need to do then, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know you guys also have, um, like, a pretty tight connection with the city, right, and city council. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess you guys have some kind of support also that comes through the through the city or you guys do things for with different city organizations or kind of how are you how are you tied to the city and how does how do they support you uh you know about 30 percent of our income come from grant the rest that we generate it and the city the city is really amazing on the sense of how much they support mm-hmm. the art right um so we receive funds from the city of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance. They allow us, they help us with the Capoeira Batizado, they help us with this uh, dance and music conference, with the festival, mm-hmm. and some of our daily operations too. Yeah. We also do a lot of stuff with the Harris County Department of Education. Okay. So you guys have some, some programs that you have in schools? Yeah. Or like after school programs? Yeah. We've been, you know, f- through the city, we've been working and receiving support from them since 2005 and the Department of Education since 07. Yeah. So we build a stronger relationship um, with them that assist our programs. You know, it, it is the extra support that allow us to make the events a little bit better. Sure. You know. Sometimes not exactly bigger, yeah, but better with the quality of people that we are able to bring, mm-hmm. and the after school programs are great. You know, um, now we are part of a selective service providers group with the Department of Education that they identified a couple of years ago, and they streamline the funds to the after school program mm-hmm. you know they they serve a lot of people and it's great to be part of that selective group and we, we go to a lot of different places in all areas of houston you know yeah to provide after school <coughs> programs and um, sometimes the kids even come to the foundation for those programs that's incredible because it seems like you know uh, i know a lot of groups or or even masteries or or instructors or professors who are kind of aspire to make like up way to their profession. That's a very hard niche to get into to where just that line of work supports your life. Right. And it seems like you guys have for many years, you know, pushed and organized and now you have this entity that supports just that. Right. Mm-hmm. 100%. Um, and that's incredible because I bet there's a lot of other people who, you know, would like to know how to even start something like that. Because it seems like that would be a great idea to start in a bunch of major cities, some kind of like, Mm -hmm. you know, foundation. But I know there was probably a lot of kind of like trial and error efforts to how do you even work? How do you begin to work with the city and and things like that? And if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, uh, Mestrando Cocada in New Orleans has also some kind of nonprofit Mm -hmm. organization as well, right? Yeah, he does. And it allows you to do it, like you said, maybe not a bigger event, but much better quality of event just from the support of the city and the organizations. Um, so, I mean, what, what were some of the, I guess some of the, the efforts and the, 
the the difficulties kind of even starting up like a project that big because it's not like you just snap your finger and one day oh we're open for business mm-hmm. and you have all that all that kind of stuff how did what were some kind of uh some kind of bumps in the road that you you know you came to as you moved through this uh, every day is school day every day is a school day yeah Learning so, all the time. Yeah, learning all the time. And just, you know, the amazing thing about uh, open a business here in U.S. or doing things is that there is so much information available. All you got to do is look for it. Mm-hmm. You know, they like, uh, and, and people ask me this sometimes, you know, how do you start? How did you get here? It's just chasing believing, you know, I believe that capoeira could provide, could be my profession. And then it's never a drop of doubt. Mm-hmm. So I I just chase the information. What is it that I want to do? I want to, well, let's open the nonprofit. Okay, what do I need to do? You know, go to the city hall and they give you a list of the steps that mm-hmm. you need to take to officially have a nonprofit open. Right? Mm-hmm. So you gotta incorporate with this with the state. So you fill out the form, you send, you pay a fee, the form is done. Yeah. You know, what's the next step? You gotta do this, you gotta do that. And you take one step at a time and you keep it moving forward. And what's the next thing? Oh, where's this information? And nowadays is amazing because everything is on your fingertips. Yeah. So you chase, how do you start this collaboration with the Department of Education? Well, who is providing grants? Mm-hmm. You, you do a search and, you know, w- once we start on that flow, I always thought about, okay, what is it that they see? What is around here close to us that can witness what we're doing closely? Mm-hmm. Okay, so is the Department of Education, is the city, that's the United Way, there's several organizations that provide funds for a startup program, right. for a specific segment, you know, like only seniors. Like we have a program for seniors for the past 10 years. Wow. We work with seniors. So what is available for that particular segment of society? Yeah. Who is, can help us to serve those people? And you, you do the search, and, and you find, you identify, okay, this play, the United Way, they give, okay, what, the, what are the criteria? Are we eligible for this grant? And you read, you know, you just chase the information. So I think sometimes people create a bigger monster than what really is. Right. Right? It's just if you compare to the physical aspect of capoeira, for example, you know, or the music aspect. I, I want to play the beating ball really well. What do you do? You play beating ball. <laughs> <laughs> you play that's beating what ball I tell, that's every what I tell day, all our students. You know, yeah. you pick up the instrument all the time and you're going to discover things on your own. Yeah. People are going to advise you on it. You're going to watch a video of somebody, a tutorial about somebody. Okay, this rhythm, I don't know how to play this rhythm. There's nobody around here to teach me. The information is available. Yeah. So you chase it. Right. It's the same thing. You know, you you said something <clears throat> just a minute ago that I think really kind of hit the nail on the head also and and shows a little bit kind of shines a light into also why you guys have been successful there in Houston in um in that service. Right. You find a way to serve the community, not just like push your push your your product on on somebody. Hey, guys, come sign up for this. Come, but also like. How do you take your group, your group of people and your foundation, and how do you provide service to other people, mm-hmm. you know? And I think, like, when that's a core element, that kind of sets you up already for success. And that's something that's that's tough, I think, for, for a lot of people, you know, is before, you know, even before you're set up and you feel like, like everything's running smoothly, if you have that idea in the back of your head, is it like, hey, we're here to serve other people, that kind of, like, floats the boat, keeps kind of pushing you on, right? Yeah, the thing is, you got to know what success means to you. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it cannot only be the numbers on the bank account. Yeah. It cannot be that. We need that. But I think it's it's find the balance between business and passion. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the passion is to serve people. We need the business aspect to be able to. So how do we find that balance? Because without, you know, the joy of walk to this community center to serve the seniors, for example. And honestly, I'm gaining much more from them than I can ever provide to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really. Yeah. Right. It's funny how service works that way, right? Yeah. You, you, you know, from the outside, you may think you're coming to do something from them. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. You know, it's the other way around. Yeah. You know, you walk to teach kids on a not so privileged area and seem like you're bringing something. No, you're learning. You're taking from them much more than you can leave because, you know, and, and those are the things that drive us. Yeah. You know, those are the things that, that make you push a little harder. You know, and, and, and give you, fuels you to the next day and to the next day. It's that joy, that 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 time that you spend with people, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, even on the paid programs and in-house, you know, the joy to see kids growing up within your program. You're participating on their lives on a much bigger way than seems to. Yeah. Right? And, and those, those things are... What keep us moving and what brings quality of life daily? Yeah, you know that that that's what success looks like to me. So, so let's now go. Uh, I want to kind of learn. So we talked a little bit about like you know the foundation and the mission and the purpose and things like this. But now let's go back, yeah, kind of back in time to. I guess your, you know, what brought you to the, what brought you to the U.S. and your involvement with Capoeira prior to coming to the U.S. Mm. And then, uh, you know, we'll kind of go from there because I'm really interested too. You know, we also share a lot of similarities in our, in our Capoeira as far as like our timeline, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and it was really cool because for me growing up as like a, you know, a young boy and teenager and adolescence, like, I saw you at a lot of events, and I also saw your growth in Capoeira too, mm. you know, um, and maybe even some some things that that I can that I can reflect on may spark a memory that perhaps you don't even remember yourself. But you know, other people from outside in uh, see those things. So, kind of seeing seeing you also throughout my my Capoeira life, and then here we are today is like that's a really really great great thing for me to also reflect on. Mm. Um, and tell us, tell us a little bit how how did you even? I know you're in Houston now with your with your brother. Yeah. Did you guys come together from from Brazil? Yeah. Tell us kind of like where you're from and how you, what made you decide to come to the U.S. What was the what was the push? Oh, uh, even before I get today, you say the involvement with Capoeira before I came to U.S. Mm -hmm. You know, Capoeira you know, is 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 everywhere there in Brazil. So I have friends that train. You see around. You see a Capoeira holiday here and there. You know, growing up in São Paulo and stuff. Um, but I was so into skateboarding. Yeah. That, you know, it was a particular time that we, my brother and I, we want to take some kind of martial art there. But my father never put us in a program. I have a lot of friends that did that did capoeira, that did all the martial arts there. It's a, it's a big thing in Brazil. A mm -hmm. lot of people do, so it's around, it's everywhere. But never really got into. What took us to Houston was skateboarding, you know. Um, That's what I'm really interested in because I skateboarded a lot also as a kid, Yeah, you know. And skateboarder was my profession, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, once we finished high school, we decided that we did not want to go to college. We want to be professional skateboarders. Yeah. And um, live the dream. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, that's what helped us to. I think I'm going to speak more about just me, you know, cause, but that time we share, my brother and I share the same lifestyle as mm -hmm. far as our passion was our profession right and that that way we living 
every day doing what we love to do. So that makes the struggles easier, you know, because you, you come to the next day and you're like, okay, let's do this. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I'm skateboarding or I'm doing capoeira. You have this business aspect that we got to make it work. But you in it is related to what you love to do. So yeah. it's different, you know, than take a eight to five, a job that you're not necessarily yeah. really like or appreciate for whatever reason you're doing. Yeah, for sure. So we started skateboard business there. You know, what I, kind of what kind of business were you guys doing? We were doing at that time, you know, skateboarding. A lot of people use rails and nose guards and tail. Wow, that's old school, tail. man. That's for those way. who for Woo! those who don't know <laughs> don't know much about skateboarding. That that's old. Yeah, old that's school. old school, man. You know, so we start from really really scratch. You got a hand saw, and we bought some polypropylene and start cutting them up and see how we could make it rails you know yeah and for the bottom of the boards for and the bottom of the board so you started slide. almost like with with skateboard accessories right yeah okay yeah. and uh you is it's it's a really great time in my life that i love to stop sometimes and remember and this is you know this is a great op- it gives me the opportunity to go back in time you know yeah so i had some friends uh, uh that were doing all the things with skateboarding and we ran the house of one of the guys had a his grandma had this house available and we ran so it was six of us my brother and i doing the the accessories the plastic accessories couple guys doing skateboard trucks and another two guys doing um protection equipment you know the the knee pads and mm-hmm. elbow pads so Man, every day we go there and try to make it. And what helps is because <coughs> we already s- skateboarders, so yeah, we knew the market. People yeah. knew us, and we you're in everywhere. the scene, and yeah. So it it made a sense to create a product because you're already in the market. You already mm-hmm. understand, you know, that sector. Right. So having the the necessity, and and also I I have to say, you know. Doing business and making your business work for you so you can live off your passion yeah. is also an art for yeah. you, you know, to be able to balance all this thing now and make it work for you according to what and you want to do. And that's a huge reward when you start seeing success of your hard work, of something you want, you, you love to do, right? Yeah. And you, start, you go after even harder. Yeah, and, and, and the success, I think, comes just from watching, it's like, I am living this life that I choose to, the way I chose to. Sure. You know, nobody else is dictating how my day is going to run or how much time I'm going to put into the work aspect or the skateboarding aspect Mm -hmm. or, you know. So we we started there and and kept pushing. It was a crazy time in Brazil, you know, economically speaking. From that house, we ran a small... Uh, room on on another place and then from then we end up renting a townhouse just for the business and then we start having some people working for us you know teenagers that were skaters too they yeah. will they need a job so we we'll, and and this is great too because you start something you plan the see and by the time you see you are helping other people too mm-hmm now you're not only creating a life for yourself, but you open opportunity for people, for another younger skater to work within the industry. And or And even see it's possible. Yeah, right? it's, you know, because it's right there in front of them. <coughs> like, oh man, these guys did. So the next mm-hmm. person feels that they can do too. Yeah. You know, and uh, in 1990, we got this new president that just flip the script on the economy, close all the banks, froze all the bank accounts. And, you know, as I told you before, inflation was at 3% a day. And we were working with the plastic. So it, it comes from petroleum. And every day, the first thing we had to do on that business is create a new price list. Because if you don't watch it, you know, you, 
you selling and you can buy the yeah. pro you know yeah. the raw product to create the product those three years having that business it was the best university i could ever go to for me right you know different people take a different path so I, I think education is vital in any form mm -hmm. or shape right it's how do you want to be educated is the choice and we chose to be educated by doing it right and and i'm really glad that i took that route so that taught us how to do business because and it was it was really crazy you know remembering things you walk into a business that you you, you know you need to buy this product and the guy look at us like two kids try to <laughs> what you know some people laugh at you mm -hmm. some people take a second look and like man boys are trying to do something and help you you know because i really believe and, and that is in anywhere in the world if you are helping yourself people will help you yeah you know it's so apparent it's so transparent when you are helping yourself, you mm -hmm. are doing something that is many more people that would extend a hand to help it than the ones that would look at you and laugh. Yeah. Now, the ones that laugh at you are just as important, I think, because that, that you need that. In terms of motivation. Oh, no question. Yeah. You need that. That's, that's a, it, can, it cannot be peaches every day yeah <laughs> you gotta get some slaps on your face you mm -hmm. know snap you out of it sometimes you you need that to steer you in the correct direction that you need to go so it, it was a great experience that i carry on today to run the organization mm -hmm. you know that really helped me to shape as how do i do things you know right and so so from there, I, I imagine you kind of mentioned some stuff about the economy changing in Brazil. That was probably one of the factors of why you want to... Did you guys decide to move your company over here or try to do... No. Uh, what happened was when we were in this townhouse, we had a commercial contract for two years. And so you pay paying your rent and it's frozen, right? So it's... it's destiny because everything funnels down and everything work out perfectly for us to leave so we we're like man of course you know so if you skateboarding especially at that time today is a different ball game the place where you want to be is in the u.s you want to be in california yeah you skating yeah you want to go to venice beach that's you right you want to be on that area you know you <coughs> want to be in san diego so that was a dream. That's funny because also like I go back when I was a kid mm -hmm. and in the in the early 90s watching skateboard videos and things like that, even a lot of the European guys were like, man, it's like, let's go to the Mecca. Everybody wants to go to California. Mm -hmm. They want to go to LA, San Diego, Venice Beach. Mm -hmm. You see all the spots in the magazines and the videos, yeah. you know? Yeah. And that, yeah, that's what's on the mags. Yeah. You know, you look at a picture, you just dream about being there, you know, witnessing that. So um, the president came in, froze all the accounts, and the lease was ending. And what we'll have to do to re-sign the lease, we'll have to take the accumulating inflation. So, you know, I can't remember in numbers, but let's say nowadays you paying your 5,000 rent is going to go to 50. There's just no way. Yeah. Now with this situation we have where the banks are fro it was a really crazy time in Brazil. Yeah. So we're like, well, if we ever going to go to U.S. to skate, this is the time. So we closed the business. We didn't sell anything. We kept all the machines and desks, everything. We were able to somehow uh, get ready with the little stock we had. And we were able to secure the visa, which a friend of ours helped us. You know, he was a photographer on the, on the magazine. And uh, he was able to... He, 
speak fluent English. He been to US mm -hmm. a lot of times, and he was able to get a letter from the NSA to invite us to come to skateboard. Oh wow! And he met some guys from Texas in a skate camp at some other place in US, and the guy always told. Him, hey, if you ever come to Texas, look me up. And Texas have always produced amazing skateboarders. Mm -hmm. You know, talking about Jeff Phillips. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he, he strike a light. And at the time, we would see a lot of skateboard videos. And it was a particular skate park, the skate park at Houston. It was an amazing park, all metal, crazy, a lot of ramps, a lot of things to skate. So we decided to come to Houston instead of California, just for the fact that we knew in California we had a lot of friends, a lot of Brazilian people there, and we felt like, man, we're going to go there, it's great, but we're not going to experience life in the U.S., per yeah. se. You're still going to be living kind of a Brazilian culture. Yeah, in the United States, you, you, you among those those <coughs> friends and yeah. everybody speaking Portuguese, which is great. It's nothing. It's yeah, great. But we, I don't know, we crazy. So <laughs> <laughs> let's take a different route and go to a place that we don't know anybody that we really gonna experience. It's starting with the language. Yeah, you know, because we had a ticket, a uh, airfare that was open for a year, and we had no idea. We came with no plans. The plan was to skate as much as we could, travel to some other place, go to California, go to other places. But we had no idea how long we were going to stay, mm -hmm. what was going to happen. We didn't speak any English. And so we were able to secure the visa, and we came. We went from the airport straight to the skate park. And this same friend, Daniel Burke, he really helped us a lot with the visa and stuff. He came with us, and he stayed five or seven days. And, you know, he was just... Just to get your footing, right? Yeah, he came from here. He went to Hawaii to skate and some other place, and then he went back to Brazil. And that was it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. We didn't know anybody. We didn't speak the language. But we were here and we were at the skate park, so yeah, we made it work. You know, I slept under the ramp for a month and skate all day, all day. It was cool. the The guy that owned the park allowed us to stay inside the property the first night, mm -hmm. and next day we cleaned the park. It just says a token of our appreciation, mm -hmm. which really surprised them, and. We stayed the next night, and we cleaned the park the next day, and the next day came. And Man, the, that's crazy. So you guys were, y'all were actually staying at the park. Like, that's where all your stuff, and you're like, man, we just don't have a place. We're going to be here for a couple nights. and We stay at the park 24-7. That's hilarious. <laughs> that's, that's hardcore, 24 man. 24-7. That's, sk that's skater die life. <laughs> oh, man. And, you know, I was 22, and just really appreciating the opportunity yeah that's what we want and we got it yeah we're here we had the park and you know we didn't speak the language but you skate so you do speak your language yeah you know and and people again you know what i say when you helping yourself people will help you and the fact that they were cleaning the park all the time then the owner didn't charge us to skate which mm -hmm. really helped you know, we had fifteen hundred dollars each. That was it. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. So we couldn't pay to stay in the hotel. You know, we wasn't a place to stay. So we stayed at the park. And from there, you know, after that, the neighbor let us borrow a trailer that she didn't use it. You know, her husband liked to hunt, and we did a lot of work cleaning her property and cleaning the park. And, you know, it, it triggers you start to meet people and you try to s learn the language mm -hmm. and one thing. You know, start rolling and you start, well, we need to make money. We're running out of it. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I cut a lot of grass. Mm -hmm. Some guys said, man, you guys should get a little more. And, 
you know, mow, <laughs> yeah. mow the yards in this neighborhood. And, and the park was at the north side of Houston, you know, by 59 and all the mayor route. <coughs> which was cool. It was a big neighborhood, a lot of houses. And we did that. We, that summer, I mowed a lot of yards. <laughs> yeah. And that was... Um, a way to just making to make it work some money and, and we made it work and, and it triggers you know then yeah. somebody needs something hey man the guys can mark and mark can help <laughs> <laughs> so they couldn't say our name i actually i met jeff phillips man really I saw him there in yeah. in uh in at the houston. skate park in yeah, houston in houston yeah he, well man we saw in 91 we saw an nsa contest there with yeah. everybody I mean, few guys were missing. Everybody. Yeah. It, it was insane to see, you know, as a young person skating in Brazil and yeah. see myself in U.S. right for sure watching a NSA contest. Man, I it remember. I remember. Surreal. Yeah, you know, it was surreal. I remember the first time I met Tony Hawk. I was like fourteen, fifteen years old, and it was uh, MTV did a sports and music festival in Austin and they brought Tony Hawk, Bob Burnquist, Andy McDonald, all these guys that I'd been seeing growing up and it was like, you know, to meet those dudes for the first time was was awesome. You know, our company was the first sponsor for Bob Burnquist. Really? Huh? It called Slide. Uh, Bob Burnquist for for those that don't know is an amazing <laughs> vert skater, uh Brazilian. Does a lot of tricks, switch also, and his style's in, incredible. He always he always been amazing, man. That guy. How did you guys how did you guys hook up with him as his his first sponsor? Well, he was skate. It was this wood ramp in Sao Paulo. The only wood ramp at that time. In and when you when you say ramp, you're referring to a vert ramp. A vert ramp. Half yeah, pipe, yeah. 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 Uh-huh. And uh, he was at his neighborhood. It was a bunch of kids there. Chris Mateus, it was his ramp. His father built for him. Okay. And um, he, he was a skate park. There a lot of people skate. And Bobby was there. He was a bunch of kids there at that time. And all these kids became amazing skaters. And Bobby was just, it was something about him, you know. Mm -hmm. we, we could see it. A lot of people could see it. And um, we, we asked him. We talked to them. And... You know, T-shirts. We didn't have a condition for a lot, but we took them to some contests here and there, mm -hmm. and T-shirts and boards and stuff. Yeah, it was not only him. We had some other kids. You know, Marcelo was a guy that worked for us that skated really well too. Mm -hmm. But he, he was great, man. He <laughs> he was a small guy, and man, he would do crazy stuff at yeah. a very young age. You know, yeah, amazing to see him. How far he took it, you know. And uh, did you guys continue your skateboarding company in the U.S.? Did y'all? Oh, not at all. No? Not at all. You know, at that time, being a professional skateboarder in Brazil, in compared to the U.S., we could barely run with the amateurs here. Mm -hmm. The level was so different mm -hmm. you know it was a huge discrepancy on the line yeah you know nowadays everybody's game yeah everybody's game yeah but at that time it was really different so yeah we we couldn't leave off a skateboard yeah just couldn't so we we got jobs labor jobs yeah <laughs> yeah and that's what so what we had to do where where was your like your initial contact with capoeira was it in the u.s or was it in in brazil it was in Brazil. Okay. You know, I stayed here in 97. I went back for the first time. Okay. And um, a friend of mine that we grew up with together, she took me to a capoeira class. You know, there in Brazil, if you, if you, if your major is physical education, a lot of universities will have capoeira as one of the subjects on your major, and that's what happened to her. You mm. know? And um, she finished, she graduated and continued training. And I went back and saw a bunch of people, all my friends that we grew up and talking to her. And she told me, you know, like, oh, you got to take me to a class. And so she did. And it was an instant connection. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Do you remember the group or the yeah yeah the professor? Oh, oh yeah, Mestre Dantas in Osasco is a a little bit outside of São Paulo. Okay. Yeah. Capoeira Regional. Yeah, Grupo Golpe Bonito. It was great. He opened the doors and really welcomed me to. It was my first contact with the world of capoeira, mm -hmm. you know, and something that I really appreciate. Mm -hmm. That was in '97. '97. '97. '97. And at that time, um. I was getting a divorce, I was married already, and my brother and I had a, we started an import and export business. We were bringing a, a friend, the same friend that started, you know, doing trucks back in the day. He continued his company. He went through the bad wave with the economy. Mm -hmm. He was able to continue his business, and he was doing well, and he had a really good quality product. We brought his product to Houston, and from here we were distributing to all the states in the U.S. and other countries. You know? Oh, wow. So yeah, I was going, I was making trips to Brazil What, what were month. you guys importing, exporting? The trucks. Oh, the trucks. trucks. Okay. Crail trucks. Oh, yeah. wow. Crail. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's we we grew up skating to mm -hmm. you know since fourteen, fifteen years old. Yeah. We know each other as a great friend, and uh, yeah, he's still at it, and his trucks are really good, and he 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 worked really hard to make a good product, a competitive product mm -hmm. worldwide. And so we were we were bringing the trucks here, and uh, they allow me to go back and forth to Brazil a lot. So. I was training all the time. Every time I go there, I go to Capoeira. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I start m meeting people in Houston that was interested in Capoeira too. You know, people that still know. Um, Mario and Amamero was a guy named Buddha that was interested in Capoeira. Different people, you know, we would get together in Houston, different places and train. Mm -hmm. Everybody ended up taking a different path, right. you know, um, and and that's how how it started for me. You know, I started get interested. In, uh, I think I was so homesick, you know, because those seven years here. Let me put it this way: when I went back to Brazil the first time in '97, I was completely lost. Mm -hmm. I did not know exactly who I was, if it doesn't make any sense. For sure. I mean, you you're know, over I'll here building almost another identity, getting used to different custom culture, you know? Yeah, and so you, and you go was, back and you're like in limbo. You're kind of like... I was so away from the culture because yeah. pretty much all the time, my brother was the only Brazilian person I knew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> here and there you meet, yeah. you know, he and, but... Yeah, I was really away from the culture. And and Capoeira made so much sense in all aspects of my life. You know, he brought me back to the culture. You mm -hmm. know, he he, I was really homesick. Yeah. I didn't know how homesick I was. Till you was went. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know how, how hungry I was. And... You know, I have to say this. He made me, for the first time, really appreciate Brazilian culture. Brazilian culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was always there available to me. And I was always blind to it for one. You know, I was, I was into skateboarding. so Yeah. It was a worldwide culture, but not as much. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. So it took me to a different type of music, a different type of lifestyle. For sure. Yeah. Completely, you know, that we try to... That's all very influenced by American culture. Yeah. So, yeah. So that took me away from the core of Brazilian culture, mm -hmm. if that is such a thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and Capoeira, Capoeira opened up my mind to it and... Uh, When I say it was an instant connection, it, it, it just brought all this together and this desire to 
do that. You know, I'd, in in the middle of all of this, I did other martial arts here in, in U.S. You know, because we couldn't make a living out of skateboard. Mm -hmm. He allowed my brother and I to do things that we always want to do. Like he he took three years of photography in Houston in school. Mm -hmm. You know, something that he was passionate about that he wanted to do. And here we had so much time yeah. for ourselves. Yeah. And uh, I went to do martial, all the martial arts, mm -hmm. which he had really helped me with Capoeira too. Yeah. He did and he didn't. I have to relearn how to move. <laughs> yeah. But, but you know, that's, that's funny because also when I was a kid, uh, young, five, maybe five years old, seven years old, I started doing karate. Mm -hmm. And that helped me a lot learn, like have a good base for uh, kicks, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I started to apply to with, with my students the other day was I was looking at the way they're throwing kicks. And it's different because like with capoeira, the, you call like the fighting stance, right? The jinga. It's mm -hmm. like, it's very frontal. Your hips are facing your opponent. In karate, they're not. You're sideways. Mm -hmm. So learning kicks like a, a shop or, or a martello in karate, you already have that side base. And you don't need to, you don't need to pivot your base leg as much to open your hips to throw a shift kick. Your hip, yeah. And when you're doing the jinga, like, you need to 100% shift to throw the kick. And so I was looking like, man, a lot of people are not turning their base leg. And they're not opening their hips to kick. And I started thinking back. I was like, well, how did I learn these kicks? And how can I, like, maybe help translate to them what I'm looking for or what's going to make a more functional and, and, and powerful kick? And I took everybody back and we hung the bags up because, we, you know, we have some, some bags to kick. And I put everybody sideways. And I'm like, let's start to learn the shapa like this. Mm. And so, okay, how do we throw the kick? And look, your hips are already open. And then bring them back. Okay, now let's do it from the jinga. The same thing, but now we're turning into the kick. And it was like a world of difference, you know. So, so in that in that aspect, you know, martial arts helped me a lot in capoeira to kind of develop a, mm -hmm. a technique. But then it's like it makes you stiff, you know, like the stance. Flash so you gotta, forward. yeah, and you have to learn again how to how to move, um, right? One of the beauties of capoeira, you know, how you, I, I, a martello, a roundhouse kick is always going to be that in any martial art. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you hide all that in the jinga? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? don't give it away, right? Yeah. How do, you, how, do you, how do you do this from this type of dancing footwork? Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. really unique and great. How, uh, so you were going back and forth from U.S. to Brazil for the import-export stuff mm -hmm. and your training. And training. <clears throat> training. At what point did you start uh, teaching classes in Houston and when did you connect with Master Di Jalone? Mm. Um, so I'll go back and forth and then mid... Which, by the way, just real quick, for those who don't know, and I think most of the people of our demographic who are listening to this, they know who Master Di Jalone is, right? <laughs> yeah. Accredited with, with, with first bringing and really like solidifying Capoeira here in the United States. Yeah, right? being the pioneer. I mean, that's... Being an, the first one Yeah, that's an in, That's incredible. Incredible yeah. base to, to come from, right? Arriving in New York. And it's cool. I talked to him about that, you know, like... He came too without knowing anybody and yeah, with a passion, yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. and and made it work for amazingly, to yeah, himself. I hope he's listening because we're gonna come, even if we got to go to New York, we're gonna have him on the podcast one day. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so I was going back and forth, and I end up, uh, uh having a relationship with this girl that took me to the class. Mm -hmm. We started dating. I'm here. She's there. It was crazy. But I decided to, I put a, I was working for DHL at the time as a driver on top of doing the business and training. Right. Always busy. Um, I took a leave absent in my job and went to Brazil for three months. Okay. You know, we, we were going now and um, we want to be together, and she couldn't come here, so I tried to go there. Um, 
So I was training all the time. I was looking for a job there and see how would work it being back there. It didn't work for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's put that way. <laughs> okay. It did not <laughs> work for me. <laughs> uh, um, but I took advantage of that time to train as much as I could. Yeah. You know, I would take at least two classes a day or sometimes three and practice the beam bar as much as I could. And, um, well, those three months ended, and I'm like, I'm, I'm going back. And I came back, and uh, then I'm, I'm on the situations like, what do I do? Because, you know, I stay in touch with all these guys that were also interested in capoeira at the time, mm-hmm. which was really great. You know, it's, it's great. And, and I still see these guys from time to time they decide to go to more to Angola style capoeira and, and they have cl- they still have classes there in Houston at the Shape Center. It's great. Um, but I need to train and uh, you need people. Yeah. You know, and that's how I end up becoming a class. Mm-hmm. I shouldn't be teaching at all. But that was my situation and I learned capoeira teaching, really. Mm-hmm. You know, because the only training under somebody for a period of time that I had was those three months. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't spend six, seven years taking classes and training under somebody to become, to have the knowledge and the tools yeah. to be, a, to teach Capoeira. Mm-hmm. But it is what it that is. Runs, that runs very parallel with how you started with education and business. Mm-hmm. It's the same lines. It's like built out of necessity, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and desire. Mm-hmm. That's what I want to do. I believe I can do it. And um, I didn't even let myself stop myself from doing it. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that that's something that's really important to do anything. You got to believe and you got to see ahead. It can be done. Why can I not do it? Yeah, I can do it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I can do it. You know, it, it, it's that dream, it's that passion, it's that driving force inside you. That's what I want to do, and I'm going to do it. Nothing going to stop, not even myself. You know, because there are days that you try to stop yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, man, this is too hard. <laughs> yeah. It's always days. And when, when you when you started, started up or teaching, did you, I mean, did you try to create like a group, like a name, or were you trying to a- affiliate with who you'd been studying with in yeah. Brazil? Yeah, I was affiliated. By that time, I had gone through <coughs> one of the batizados there okay. and got the first score down. And, um, you know, I talked to Master de Dantes and told him that once I had to start teaching. I had to do something to move forward, Yeah, you know. And when I came back from Brazil, I, I, I was not in the position to travel all the time there anymore. You know, the... Just import, financially and... Yeah, the import and export business took a different route, you know, economy chain. It was several variables that mm-hmm. I just couldn't go all the time. So that made it even harder. So I I was still working for the DHL. So I had a, a job that would allow me to pay my bills and stuff. I looked for a dance studio. I ran a very small room and I'll pay the rent and go train and my brother helped me do some flyers and I start passing out flyers and Mm -hmm. and put a time and schedule and it took a while but people start showing up and uh, you know they show up sometimes they don't show up Yeah, yeah and you know the struggle at the beginning but you know, I'm gonna keep it doing it. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna do it for myself, regardless. Of people do. Yeah, and, and that's how you started. And then early in 1990, I started the first class. I thought, you know, that we had this fly and all that. It was in November '98. November '98. Yeah, and. I can't really, it was around that time that uh, a friend of my Brazilian friend in Houston, Claudinha, she told me about Lalo that was teaching San Antonio. 
Mm-hmm. She's like, hey, I heard a guy from Bahia that teaches capoeira in San Antonio. And she, she got me his phone number. So I called him and I came to a class. And um, I was blown away. Man, there's somebody right here close to me. That yeah. Can, you know, and it was a different style of capoeira. And, uh, you know. What, what do you mean different? What do you mean different style? Just I mean different ways to do things. Okay, you know the techniques yeah. and, and, and all that. But still, you know, he, still Capoeira, still Capoeira regional. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. It's just yeah, different. Yeah, you know different mm-hmm. group, sure. different traditions, mm-hmm. different fundamentals. Yeah, even different. the jinga looks different. Yeah, yeah, completely. You know, and um, so I call Lala, came to classes, and 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 Lalo was uh, he was instructor at that time. He was great. He was really welcoming and uh, let me take the classes when I could. He gave me a bunch of tapes to watch Capoeira events, mm-hmm. you know, big events with a lot of big names in Capoeira. And, you know, that, that was a, that was amazing, you know, how he, he, he opened up the doors for me to participate in, in his class. Mm-hmm. So I kept coming and... Early 1990, Message Alone came to Lalo's event with the Dance Brazil. Dance Brazil was in town, and so Lalo did the batizada, the capoeira batizada at the same time. Mm. And that's when, I s- and with Dance Brazil was Aladdin, Gafanhoto, Borracha, now Mestre Joe. Esquilo, too. Esquilo was not on this trip. No? no okay. Esquilo was not. Um, now, Mestre Piquinês, Mestre Envergado. So and were I they... I saw, I met all these people. On this therapy. trip, were they doing something with Dance Brazil? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, wow, they were I participating didn't... in the Dance Brazil. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't realize. That's, that's why. So I that was kind of like their doorway to get in and, and... Yeah, they were traveling with wow. Dance Brazil. They were in the show. I didn't realize that, that Mestre Piquinês was, was involved with dance brazil yeah oh, okay they, they were on that on the tour that year i understand yeah. okay and then i was really blown away mm-hmm. you know cause I'm yeah like, wow that's the capoeira i want to play now is know? that the the event that the, we're talking about was the one in 98 that a little while ago we were we were probably that was your first time to also also meet our my master messi rodrigo messi rodrigo right yeah. i think uh, around that time yeah and uh, it was, it, you know, Lalo would participate in, in street festivals, mm-hmm. you know, in, in San Antonio. And I remember coming to one of them. And I think that's exactly what I met Mestre Rodrigo the first time. It was one of the festivals. Mm-hmm. You know, it's keeping my mind now if it was before or after that particular event. Right. But, yeah, he he was there on this event, too. So yeah. That's when I met all these mm-hmm. people and amazing capoeiristas and Master Jalon. And, and that was your first contact with, with Master Jalon? Yeah. It was around that time? Yeah. Okay. It was on that event. Mm-hmm. It was the first time I met him. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. yeah, and I stay at Lalo's house at that time and I had the opportunity to talk to more with him and stuff. And, mm-hmm. You know, r- shortly right after, I couldn't go to Brazil anymore. It was hard to continue training and I, I explained that situation to Master Jalon and talked to him and asked if I could be part of his school. So again that's somebody else opening the doors for me. Mm-hmm. You know, and which the, I really I'll be forever grateful for Lalo and and for Master to, to mm-hmm. open that door for me here. And and for those who don't know that are listening, Lalo is Jalon's nephew? Master Jalon's nephew. Master yeah. Jalon's nephew, right? Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, and he 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 told me, well, you need to talk to the person, to Master Dantas, and explain the situation, and if everything cool, you can be part of the school. Mm-hmm. So that's what happened, and I became part of it, and... Uh, Still in 99, I brought message along to Houston for the first time to teach workshop. Okay. I still have that flyer. Wow. Uh, you know that. 
Um, and he thought the workshop it was great at the same dance studio where I first yeah. thought. Um, that lady, Barbara King Dance Studio, that lady was amazing too. You know, it was a ballroom school. Capoeira was so away from what they do. You uh -huh. know? But she was also very welcoming and opened the doors for us to rent the space and have the classes there. It was great. Mm -hmm. I, I see her from time to time in Houston. So yeah. it's, it's great. And so Mastery came and I continued training. So by then I was I would come to San Antonio, I'll go to any event. We were at the time Mestre Elon was part of Grupo Capoeira Brasil. Mm -hmm. So it was uh now Mestre Caxias was teaching in New York and, and Mastery was teaching classes at that time in New York, I think so too. So I will I will go as much as I could. Mm -hmm. You know. And the first event that I went as part of the group was still in ninety nine at Mestre Caxias in New York, which another you know really opened the doors for me to meet a lot of other people. You know, in New York is such a mecca for Capoeira in the US. Right. So it was a lot of people on his events always and it was great. In two thousand we had the first Houston Batizana. It was the first Houston Batizana. Yeah. Okay. In two thousand we had at the University of Houston downtown campus. Hmm. It was great. Um so you some of the Capoeiras that were there was message alone. Tiba, Esquilo, Borracha, Aladdin, Alegria, Gavião, you know, mm -hmm. he was training with uh, Lalo and he was there. Yeah. Wow, first, man. Ev first event. You know, and, and uh, back then, there wasn't a, there was almost, there wasn't a lot of Capoeira in Texas. And it was almost like, I mean, you know, you even kind of said, like, you started teaching out of, like, the necessity, right? You need people to train with. So you're like, let's, you're yeah. going to have to open a school, find some. Yourself. Yeah. And when there wasn't a lot of capoeira in and around, it was almost like, it was like, you know, people trying to, to grow their roots for the first time. It was almost like the Wild West. Like, you know, it's like a lot of things, I want to say maybe un unorthodox the way or the way the organization is now, mm -hmm. right? Because now, like, you don't see a lot of people just out of necessity for their own training open a school. No, there's, like, a systematic way because there's more organization now rooted, there's right? more people teaching. So yeah, there's more people you, teaching. and usually a process like, allowed for you. Exactly. Yeah. There's, like, a, like, another process. And, um, I mean, I remember, too, back then, just, like, anytime there was an event with, uh, with Lalo, down in Tennessee, we were always there mm -hmm. because that was like our closest connection. Yeah. And then having you guys come up too was like, oh, now we made like a triangle. We have yeah. like, you know, Is a little more people. Huh? Yeah, more people. Um, and the first time that uh, that I met Master Jalone was uh, we did a bachizado in conjunction with uh, Lalo's group. Mm. And so we had our bachis all together down in really? San, down in San Antonio. Oh, how cool! And it was my uh, I was getting my third corda. I think I was fourteen, something like that. And I played with Master Jalone for my third corda, and Contra Mascaxias was there as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was very cool because I, you know back then I remember it was a big deal for us. The only way that Master Rodrigo allowed you to get your corda was you need to play with another master. It was never your master or someone in your group that played you and your batizada for, yeah. you know. And that's, an, that's a, a really cool tradition in Capoeira is like, you need contact with other people and you need contact with other groups, you know. Mm -hmm. You train in your school here, but it's like, no, but we need also like, it's almost like a, like a verification from the community as a whole. You don't grow just within your own group. Mm -hmm. You also need, you know, that yeah, it's kind of part of the culture, yeah, of Capoeira, and right. the support from other people. So that was, you know, at the time for me, I didn't know who Master Jalone was. I didn't do my homework and know, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and uh, or even like 
like the other guys, like, you know, kind of unaware of the story with Lalo and, you know, because I was also just kind of for the very first time uh, seeing Capoeira and Capoeira wasn't like in the open air. I mean, the first time I saw Capoeira was with the movie Only the Strong, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's also how Massey Rodrigo started the momentum for his group, too. You know, yeah. it's like... Those Panther tapes with the Mestre Amin and the other guy, that I don't remember his name. AOE was also available, and that's something that... Yeah. You know, with those guys in uh -huh. Houston that told you we would get together, work out, and watch a lot of those tapes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That was, that was cool, man. Uh, and those events, I mean, it seems... Almost every year you try to bring Master Dij alone to your to your mm -hmm. event, right? Yeah. Um, and then kind of watching so that you said two thousand, early two thousand was the first your first, yeah. event, first in, event in Houston, 2000. right? Mm -hmm. Do you remember back then, uh in the Capoeira Brazil system, what gorda you had around more or less? Yeah, well at so when uh, when I went from Mestre Dantas to Mestre Gelon, I, I, he told me, well, you need to put a raw corda uh -huh. on with your uniform. And Which we'll that, see that's what your first corda, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you started class and that's mm -hmm. you get the raw corda. So on that event in 2000, he gave me a, at the time it was red and blue. Okay. Which was so heavy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You mean you Ooh. mean you mean heavy because Ooh. of the the expectations that come with it, right? Yeah, the level. The you know, I was already teaching. Yeah, so and for people who don't know, is that y'all the capoeira Brazil like monitor corda, or what is yeah. the what was the red and blue? Because I remember I don't know the if it was monitor. Now, now you got me. Or if it, the blue was a monitor. You know, one of those two. because I remember also coming up, uh, going to several of y'all's events. You know, I say y'all is in your, you know, your group with with Capoeira Brazil and now Capoeira Luanda. And I remember people getting the blue red corda and that being like a a big deal. A big deal. Oh yeah. It wasn't yeah. like oh you're getting your first or your second or your third corda. Oh it was no, like, it nope. wasn't a light corner. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't light. It was heavy. Yeah. But y you know that. Explain you know, explain you know. a little bit just real quick when I want to get to know the idea of what you're of in your mind what heavy means. You know, what was the what were the internal like thoughts and expectations that came with that? Because it's also something that you don't want to live down, you want to live it up. You know? Exactly. Well, you know, the standards that were on front of me were Aladdin, Gafanhoto, Esquilo, Borracha, Amazing Alegria, Macarrão. Yeah. Um, so many people from Boca do Rio, those are the standards. And I was, wow, I was so far from that. You felt so far away from that? Eternity away. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, man, that was, it was unreachable for me at that time. Mm -hmm. it, it was just, but it was the driving force at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's how you look at it. Yeah. That's one side that when I say it's heavy because now I'm, I'm carrying on the name of Message Along and I'm doing, you know, he's supervising my work and these are the standards that are in front of me. Mm -hmm. And so those are my goals. And... Um, I had to find a way to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it, it wasn't easy. It was days that was really hard that I, I felt small, mm -hmm. really small is the word that comes to mind. Yeah. You know, but at the same time, it was the driving force. So I didn't spend a lot of time thinking too much, I'm like, I need to do it. Mm -hmm. So I, I was chasing, always chasing. I'm still, I'm still chasing. Yeah. And, and that will never end. Yeah. You know, it's a school day. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Today's school day, tomorrow's school day. Yeah. And you keep it pushing, you know. And uh, see, this uh, again, 2001, I went to the event in Salvador and Master gave me the blue cord. He got even heavier. We would joke that, <laughs> Mas, Mas would joke that even the airplane was tipped over. <laughs> the cord that was so heavy. Now, now we're talking about feeling really small. You know, event in Salvador and Boca do Rio. And, and something that I have to say, you know, all these guys that I mentioned took me in like a, like a brother. Mm-hmm. You know, I went to Boca do Rio several times. I always stayed at Esquilo and Borracha's house. Everybody took me as part of the family. And, and that was really helpful. Yeah. Know? I learned so much from all of them. They, they always been my inspiration mm-hmm. to keep going to get better and to, yeah you know um and and being on a v- event with Master Jalon's event in Salvador with so many amazing capoeiristas yeah you, you know the intensity it was different you know I'm isolating Houston you know come mm-hmm. to San Antonio and do we take some class but then I'm in Brazil on the event in Bahia, you know, in Salvador. That was amazing. Yeah. You know, I felt a little even this, if I could feel smaller, that was the day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was tough, you know, just to put my foot inside the hall. And yeah. You know, you but you, you face your fears, you face your insecurities, and... Uh, you move forward. Mm-hmm. You're like, this is what I want to do, and I believe I can do it. And you keep it pushing, and you keep it pushing. And and in that event, 2001, Master Jalon gave you your blue corda. And f- and for those of, of us that are kind of outside y'all's, your system, what does the blue corda represent? Well, now we call graduado, but, okay. you know, we're still Capoeira Brazil, and yeah. it was, it was it's a big deal, too. Right, yeah. You know, I got a blue cord together with um, it's myself, <coughs> I think Alegria, Macarrão, Cira, and Kainana. I think it was the five of us that got the blue cord. Mm-hmm. I remember. Uh, and Aladdin, Aladdin got green, I think Gafanhoto too. And I green is instructor? Who, yeah. 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 I remember that day. It was a great event. Yeah. Heavy, too, you know, then, then comes he. <laughs> but he, he helped me. You, you know, the master always knows better. Yeah. And and I think that's what I need to, to keep it pushing, you know, because every time you're comfortable. Yeah. You're not moving forward. Yeah. So being uncomfortable with a cord on the sense, like I need to work my way in. You know, you you get a cord, it, it just means that you finish with the previous one. You just, you know, on that level, you're just starting. Yeah. You know, it's, that's, it's the that's bottom, bottom of it. I'm, I'm, <laughs> you know, you, you get a blue cord, you're not a blue cord. No. You, you're you going to take years for you to be a blue cord, you know, or a green, yeah. or whatever it is. You're going to have to work, you, you're starting a new process you know that's that's awesome that's really cool that you that you touch on that because i think it's some things that are overlooked now um with like the process of getting your corda right i think almost getting up into the cordas that really matter for us was like yellow blue blue right they hold like this expectation like you're saying it's like a it's like a heavy corda and uh it was also those expectations were not something necessarily that Master Rodrigo said, okay, now with this cord that you have to do this, you know, it was almost like, it was like an innate thing. Like you said, it was like, man, my goals now become aligned with like the objectives also of my master in our school and our, and you feel the obligation to uphold those things. And I never felt ready to get the next cord. In fact, I dreaded it. Every time our bachis all like up until we got our professor cordas. We never knew if we were getting a corda or not, mm-hmm. you know. And it's like he calls your name, and your name, your heart sinks to the to your stomach, and you're like, oh, man. 
Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, man. Here we go. And like you said, it's it's it symbolizes the beginning of that process of that corda. You're never jumping. Oh, and you're in the middle of your the process of that corda, mm-hmm. and that's something that people need to understand too. You know, it's like it's, it's just uh, you, you know. That's an interesting. You, you got to seventh grade. Yeah, it means you finish six. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you start in your first day of school, <laughs> and you, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's the same. Were Were there any um, any traditions or or fundamentals that Master Jalon made it very clear to you that were important for you to pass on to your students? You know, like things that he was like. Uh, you know, I don't know, a tradition or uh, or even like a way to be a leader for this this new community of people that you were growing? Or was it all just kind of like an internal feeling of of obligation that you had to to him as a master and and to uphold those values? You know, I ask I asked the reason I asked this is mm-hmm. because I never sat down with Messi Rodrigo and he said, okay. You need to, I want you to do this, and I want my legacy to be like this. It wasn't something. It was just something inside that, like, yeah, you strive for. It's so leading by example. Right. So you look at what he's doing. Mm-hmm. You look at how he conducted harder. You look at how he teach classes. You look at what the values are, what are the comments, how he approach a situation inside the class or inside an event and you follow. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Mastery have the, you, you know, and that's something that he always say. He want us, all of us, to develop ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he. we look at, he have the standards by what the fundamentals are, what the traditions for us right. are, and you follow. But you know, he he want everybody to be to also create the ways that you do things. He opens to that. You know, you you have to be yourself. We have these are the standards that are here. We all follow those standards. We all follow these traditions and the fundamentals and how we conduct the harder, for example, how we set the battery. All those things are the same. Right. We, right? We share that. Those traditions, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you have the flexibility to teach your class with your teaching style. Everybody's different. I understand. So it's going to be mm-hmm. different a little bit. And even all of us, as teachers under him, everybody plays a little bit different. Everybody have a little different twist on their jingle or their whatever, it, their mm-hmm. identity, mm-hmm. right? Everybody's different on the way and everybody brings that to right. the group or to Capoeira itself. Right. So it, it was never a sat down talking exactly. Of course, we have meetings when we together and we talk about the situations and things, but, you know. Um, now with Capoeira Luanda, we, we had a last year, which was really amazing. I really love it. A graduados event where we sat down and talk about even having the list of the names of the techniques mm. unified through, you know, mm-hmm. throughout the Capoeira Luanda school mm-hmm. all over. Everybody. Um, follows the same thing right and, and you know the objectives and and the traditions of the school and stuff which was great and in 2018 the event is going to be in houston which is an honor to yeah have it there and it's only for blue cord and up okay to really help with the you know i think it's so important to have that to to keep it that conversation and and open for questioning and for us to talk because right. you know everybody's in a different city different place mm-hmm. it's it, it's just like any other sector yeah you know you you need it like we go take a workshop that's your continuing education within your profession yeah <clears throat> you know we need that leadership to to take the role and keep it guiding everybody. Yeah. And we keep it bringing people from under us and eat trickers. Right. right. It keeps moving forward. Yeah. 
that's uh <laughs> you know you you mentioned another key word that i that i want to go back to is the continued education man that's so important right every day school and there day. was a there was a there was a moment <clears throat> i'll tell you this there was a moment uh when I was, you know, much younger in Capoeira and going to a workshop was just like, oh, it's cool, it's fun, gonna learn some new stuff. And, but I didn't have the insight to say, like, or to think, like, man, this is like, this is my continued education. Like, I was going and learning something, but it wasn't like, I didn't look at it almost as, um, like, not as a profession, but like a scholastic way to increase your ability and knowledge of, a, of something, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, even now, I mean, you're a professional in whatever it is, web design. Okay, well, you're going to look for another, like, course to be a little bit better to stay up with the time and mm-hmm. also to stay to stay current with what's going on, right? Yeah. And you learn that from also uh, so many instructors and professors, masters, contra masters, outside of your own group. Oh, yeah. You know? Of course. That's, yeah, a, yeah. that's another, like, uh, you know, very important thing that I see. Um you know, I I think the most thing for me, right? The most important thing for being a teacher is to remain being a student. Mm-hmm. I I can't see myself separating those things. Yeah. Things, you know, I go teach class. I'm learning from the students that day. You're watching something. You're learning from. You know, everybody brings something different. So you you constantly learning, and I always look as a another learning experience. It's great to sit and take class with somebody, mm-hmm. and be a student on that day. Yeah, you know, yeah. And especially you teach class all the time. It's so refreshing to go to a class and you. Do, I'm the student. Yeah, I I'm 100, not, I'm not 100. percent I'm not on the front. I'm yeah. not dictating how. Mm-hmm. The class run, I'm not um, choosing the technique that we're going to work at that day. Right. I'm there to learn. Yeah. And that is vital, I think, for me to keep improving as a teacher. Mm-hmm. you got to be a student. There's no other way. So uh, a couple of questions that, and, and things that I kind of see a little bit different now. Back in like the 90s and early 2000s, what are what are some of the differences in capoeira in general that you see kind of here and like evolve till now? And I'll, I'll give you some examples of like some of my feelings about it where I remember a lot of those events and I don't know if it was because I was younger seeing seeing the situations are could be the same situations as now, but it seemed to me like back then when there wasn't so much capoeira everywhere and every event you went to was like intense. And it seemed like like it was like some of the hodas were a little more rough. And I don't want to say like it was almost out of necessity of of uh of like proving um I don't even know if it was proving, but it's like, you know, we have our capoeira school here and this is kind of like our house and and now I feel like because there's more community and knowledge of Capoeira, I feel like some of the events kind of simmer down a little bit. It's not as in, not as intense. Like, does that does that make sense? Is that it, it, it makes sense? Um, I th- I think it, it can be just intense. I, I understand what you're saying, mm-hmm. um, and I agree that. When you have less experience in capoeira, you see things one way. Yeah, for sure. So I, for me, it's like it may seem that way, but I think it's also because I have more experience in capoeira now. Mm-hmm. So I see it. something that before could look as very intense right now is standard. Yeah. It's part of it. Right. You know, and, and I think a big difference, too, is that, like you say, because it was less people and, and technology, Yeah. you know, you didn't have all this available that you can see a Honda yeah. happening live. Yeah. Right now, you can get online and it's a thing happening in Brazil, anywhere in the world, that you see people playing Capoeira. Yeah. It wasn't available. You know, you had to get a tape, a VHS tape. Yeah. 
You gotta get VHS tape yeah. from so and so's batizado. And somebody had that tape that you don't, and you share, and you, you know, oh man, you have this tape. Man, I gotta see this batizado. Yeah. You know? You remember, like, one of the big things for me, like, really exciting and, and like, you know, make me a little bit nerve, makes me a little bit nervous or made me a little nervous is when you show up to a Hoda and there's people you've, you don't, you've never met. And you don't really know their cordless system, their level. You've never seen the guy play. And it's like you guys are discovering each other for the first time in the Hoda. And there's a lot of like action reaction type thing. And that brings a really cool feeling of like of unexpecting, not being able to expect something. Because it's not like, oh, I'm going to go to, you know, Conta Master Gringo's Hoda for the first time. Let me YouTube. Oh, I can see some games. I kind of see... I know a little bit what to expect. No, you go in there and it's like, man, seeing for the first time playing with somebody is very unique. Yeah, and uh, I think that's part of what uh, makes addicting too. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that type of excitement, that type of vibe that yeah. is, is new, is unknown. You don't know exactly. You step to play with somebody that you never played that you don't know who it is is that you have no idea how the game gonna go about mm -hmm. but you know who you are and what you play and what you're capable of it, and you apply those and how do you deal with yeah what the other person is bringing mm -hmm. whatever it is that's bringing right you know? whatever the intent right yeah yeah and 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 that's part of a big part of capoeira and a lot of other sports mm -hmm. and, you know y and you go and you you practice with other people you go to a different city for and it's great yeah it's, it's another day in school yeah <laughs> another hard is another experience is is a extra experience under your right corda that you can you know there you know uh Another interesting interesting thing with kind of all martial arts in general is uh, is unique. Is like you can put a lot of time into something, right? And you can become very good, like idealistically at that thing. But with the martial arts, or even like with uh, with skateboarding, like you said, coming here and making a profession of that is like, man, the professional level there versus here is like there's a big difference, right? Mm. So at one point in your kind of capoeira career, like the physicality and you being a very good, effective capoeirista, like learning to use your technique as a martial art is very important, right? Because you also need to know how to how to defend yourself. Yeah. You know, you go to a hall that you don't know somebody, you don't want to just be somebody's punching bag, you know? And you need to know very well also how to effectively use like a martial art, you know, just to kind of, kind of stay safe. And I don't say, I don't say that to bring like, you know, uh, like a nervous sensation to like beginner capoeiristas, but it is very important too, that like your skill set matches like where you are also, your core, then, right? Yeah, yeah. That's very important. I think, um, you have any kind of comments on that? I mean, we have, there's some, you know, We've had some people in our group, too, that are um, older in age. And, of mm. course, like their, their skill set will not match someone that's 25 years old. It, it, it won't, you know. And so sometimes, like, the cordas that are, yeah, <laughs> well, well, eh, yeah. You know, the, the cordas that, that they deserve sometimes, just the physicality is not 100% there. And then it's like, you know, they do deserve this, but let's think of, of also what their aspirations are in Capoeira mm -hmm. too. Because not everybody's aspiration is to become a teacher or a master or, or something like that, you know? Depends mm -hmm. on, the, on the pressures you kind of put on yourself. Yeah, I think as far as the core, this, you know, is, I look at, the, at a student, what, what is his or hers potential? Mm -hmm. And how far that person is taking the potential, you know, because, you know, there's different age, there's different body types, there's different lifestyles. Yeah. So it's very unfair to compare. Of course, a core the self within the school have particular standards. Yeah. Right? But 
people are different. So I can compare this student to that student. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes things that at the time of the baptizado, people forget. Well, but hold up. This student practices three times a week. This one only practices once a week. Yeah. The one that goes once a week is sometimes living more to their potential with the last time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For whatever reason. Right. You know, so I try to really look at each individual. It, what's their potential? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and the martial arts aspect is like all the other aspects of capoeira are equally important. So you got to know. So if you don't know, if you don't experience, how you, what you're going to teach? Right. Yeah. Right? If you never go to a harder day, day it's maybe too intense for your level or for your your fears or your insecurities or whatever it is you know you gotta be you gotta face it because mm -hmm. you need to explain somebody else or how to face it yeah and what works what didn't work for you right which brings me back to what I think is really important is training. Mm -hmm. We can talk about capoeira all day long. We can say this. We can watch a video. We can do this. We can blah, 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 blah. Are you training? Are you putting time on? Yeah. You want to get better? Yeah. You wanna like anything. Better? Mm -hmm. And, you know, like all the things, those harders and those games, are not the incentive for you. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to take a fall. You got to take one on your face sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, that's part of it, the process. Right. That we have to learn how to enjoy and how to deal with it. You know, any capoeirista will face somebody in front of you that just want to take your head off. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's one thing. How do you deal with it is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. How do you keep your state of mind calm when the storm is coming at you. Mm -hmm. How can I explain this to somebody else? How can I share my experience of going through that to a beginner student that is really gung-ho about capoeira and start traveling and going to places and going to see stuff? They, that's part of the teaching, too. The, you know, you're not only teaching techniques, you also teaching life experience, mm -hmm. how to deal with it, and you share. This, yeah. this, this is what works for me. This is what, of course, I'm always going to be different than everybody else. Can nobody else be gringo, and gringo cannot be anybody else but gringo. Yeah. So how do I share this? How do I assist yeah. the next person mm -hmm. to understand that and to know that that's going to happen? Right. Right? Just like any other... Whatever sport that you play, whatever it is that you do, you're gonna face those things. Yeah, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then also, you know, another another unique thing about about you, and I hate to, I don't want to give anything away. We won't, we won't no, we talk can't. numbers or ages. Oh, we, I got no problem <laughs> with that. Um, <laughs> how old are How old are you now? You did you have a birthday recently? When was your birthday? Yeah, August. I'm fifty. In, in, just turned fifty. Man, congratulations. Um, that's incredible too. I mean, I see like, I started capoeira, I was 30 years old. This is where I was going was, was, uh, you started late in the game, mm -hmm. you know? And at least in my experience, I haven't met a lot of other masses, contra masteries that arrived at this level, right? Mm -hmm. Without starting at a much earlier age, at least like in their teenage years, twenties, something mm -hmm. like that. You know, I've had um, only a few other encounters with, uh, you know, Mastery Jilaho. I think he's in no. Nevada. He comes from Mastery Swasuna. Mm. And he was in, uh, uh, did some workshops and, and, and things in Austin. I had some time to, I had an opportunity to spend a little time in, w with him. And Talk one thing you. he said was, uh, and he was like, yeah, you know, it's, I started Capoeira in my uh, 20s, you know. And I never thought that starting that late that I would ever arrive here where I'm at today. Mm -hmm. But it's like, you know, um, it's very unique. It's different, you know. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. About I mean, I don't imagine it was 
you know, way different. But there is a difference when you're a kid learning something and when you're already, you've already gone through like adolescence and now you're, you're put here and it's like a whole new, mm-hmm. you know, skill set. Yeah, it's interesting, you know. It just took longer for Capoeira to find me. Yeah, yeah. And vice versa. Uh-huh. Um, it's, it's interesting, you know. And I, I always, even there I start really late at 30 years old. <laughs> it was my first Capoeira class. Mm-hmm. I always been very f- in physical activities, you yeah. Know? So I grew up playing soccer and skateboarding, and I did the other martial arts, and always physical. So all these things play a big role. I think starting at thirty is not the issue; is what you have done the first thirty years. Mm-hmm. Are you a thirty that's been sedentary your entire life? Yeah. You know that plays a role. So f- for me, starting at thirty was never an issue. It's mm-hmm. just Okay, because I'm accustomed, I've always been accustomed to physical activity. Yeah. It's part of my daily Already life. Already in great shape. Yeah, and I, I can do without. It's just it's, it's part of who I am. Mm-hmm. You know, I need that physical activity yeah. to have a balanced life, you know, to function well. You know, even even like today with the, the organization and organizing the event and doing this and doing that, if I'm not training, if I don't, you know, there are days that I'm overwhelmed with the work in the office, but I finally learned that I need to this is the time that I schedule to train. I need to turn all this off and I need to go to the floor and train. Yeah. And the, I come refreshed. Mm-hmm. That allows me to conduct the organization better. Yeah. You know, so it's, again, whatever age you start, whatever your history is, it is what it is for you. It's maybe completely different from other people. But at the end of the day, a capoeira belongs to who trains. Mm-hmm. Are you training? Yeah. You know, you get to a hall, you go to a venue, do you feel prepared? Do you, and when I say feel prepared, I think of it, am I comfortable with myself? Mm-hmm. Am I secure? Yeah. You know, can I step? Are you producing what you expect from yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. And the only way to produce is to put time in it. So... There it goes. That's the secret. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you gotta be training. Yeah, you know, you you gotta be, you got to be trained. Yeah, and the training may be that you sit down and play your beating ball. Yeah, I was gonna say too. You know, I mean, it it there comes a time where we're also uh, you need to put a lot of energy and effort outside of your capoeira class to be better. And not just with the physical stuff, but I'll tell you this, if you're only playing, practicing playing the beating ball for the 10 minutes in class, you're never going to play beating ball well. You need to have a beating ball, you need to play at home, you need to go after a little bit more. Yeah, you know, you know people, people ask, you know, as a teacher, and even with the Portuguese program at the foundation, mm-hmm. sometimes some people call and like, how long is it going to take me to fluently speak Portuguese? So like, well, that's a hard question. Can you tell me how much you time you're willing to put every week? Yeah. What is it that you're willing to do? Because that's what you need to ask yourself. You're asking me something that I can only you can answer. Yeah. How much time are you willing to put in to listen to Portuguese, to do the homework, to read, to watch a movie, watch a video, watch the news, sing. How much time are you willing to put in? That's the question, you mm-hmm. know? And you have the answer real quick and the result or no result. Right. According to... So it, I think it's a, really about looking in the mirror before you say anything. Mm-hmm. You know, like it, I even tell... the our students in, in, in Houston, you know, when, when you think about the batizado, and re- regardless of how much you train or not, every student kind of expects a little bit. It is that kind of yeah. expectation. One. 
But tell them, like, look, please. You mean like they, they're expecting you to get their next corda? Is that what you mean? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Y- y- you sure. know, we, not even the corda, but recognition in any kind of shape yeah. or form. Mm-hmm. Right? Of course, getting the corda is the highest recognition. Recognition, yeah. Right? But recognition, if you keep your ears open, come every day in class, when you put a student in, and you see that that student, you know which student is putting extra time outside of the classroom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know by the way they play the instrument, by the way they sing, by the way they're singing. You can tell all oh, that. Mm, you've been training that, right? Mm-hmm. So sometimes I think the recognition of s- a teacher, sometimes may not even be your teacher. You go to some place else and the person put you on the side. Man, you're doing this really well. That's really cool. I can tell you're working on it. Yeah. You know, so I tell them, it's like, look, before you look at the person besides you that got a cord or didn't get a cord, before you think, oh, Gringo didn't give me the cord, or Gringo gave me the cord, or whatever, master approved this cord. Please take a look at yourself mm-hmm. and look it back. And did my capoeira change? How much time did I put in? You know, how many times, and I think everybody goes to the how many days that is a class or it is a time that you have to train in that you choose not to? Yeah. How many times did you miss a training session, being by yourself or at the class or a hard or whatever it is? Oh, I'm just going to sit here and watch this instead of go training. Yeah. I'll do it tomorrow. How many times did you do that? You know, it's. It, uh, I think we we always have to look ourselves first because it's so easy to look what's outside you know Mm -hmm. my mom used to say you know monk sits on his own tail so he only see the other people's tails (laughs) (laughs) right can you look at yourself and you know yeah you, you you get what you have today is a consequence of what you done last year few years ago yeah and all that for sure. So n- today, you're getting the result of that. Yeah. A- and they can tell you how to guide your future. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's capoeira, like, okay, you know, we just finished a batizado. This happened. I got a cord. I didn't get a cord. You know. And, and I always tell my students my own experiences. You know, Messi Jalon just gave me the cord contra Messi, which is heavy for me. When when did you graduate for your contramassive Th- court? This year in end of August. And where yeah. did you guys have the have the event? In New York. In New York. Yeah, like we it was it was really amazing. We um, mastery decided because it was the ten year celebration of Capoeira Luanda to only have one event in New York, and even students from other groups that from other branches that were giving a student a blue cord or a blue and green or green or purple, whatever it was, had to do that in the event. So that's when I received that cord. So that that is a new level that I'm not at, <laughs> that I'm starting. And just like somebody that just started Capoeira, I have to put the time in to mm-hmm. work into that level. You know, so in different levels, but we going through the same process. Mm-hmm. You know, tell everything that I'm telling you guys that you need to do is what I tell myself. Mm-hmm. And that's what I do to myself. I have to go train. I have to go train my jinga. That's the foundation of everything. I have to, I have to train jinga. Yeah. You know, it may be what looks the most simple thing within the art. It can be the most complex thing, mm-hmm. too. You know, it will For make sure. or break you in the game. Yeah. Were you, did uh, did you guys discuss beforehand that you're going to be getting your, your Contra Master Corda at this, at this event? Or was it a surprise? Like, how was it? No, at that level, Master would. Yeah, me. make sure yeah, that he you told have me everything before, prepared. Yeah, this, yeah. This year, I, I'm giving the contra-message corner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, very Which cool. Which was a shock. <laughs> and, 
It, but, you know, um, I think I have always worked best with my back against the wall. Yeah. When the pressure is on, when I feel the pressure. And the pressure is what you put on yourself. Sure. You know, I look at Master Jalon and the opportunity that I have to be his student, to be under his guidance, and uh, Mestre Guerreiro and Mestre Apache, and Contra Mestre Esquilo, Contra Mestre Chuvisco, all the other Contra Mestre, Contra Mestre Borracha, and all the professors in our school and everything. Everybody go through this process, and I want to continue to get better. That's the life I chose to. Mm -hmm. And I need to keep working so I can keep passing to the students and lead by example, regardless of my age. Yeah. You know? It's great to, you know, the different people sometimes, they put, oh, Gringo, you know, man, you start and, and you're 50 now, you, you're playing and this. And, and I'm like, well, that's, that's how it happened to me, mm -hmm. you know. But it all applies the same. Yeah. Just train. Yeah. Just work on it. Put work on it. Everything in life is work. You and guys in uh in now so it's been ten or last year was ten years that you guys made the change to yeah, Capoeira year, Luanda. This year. Uh, uh, 2017. Yeah. Currently you guys have uh I mean you named off like a, a handful of mass contra mass and stuff and, and it was cool because I a lot of these guys like I got to watch their progression in Capoeira too. Is there anyone right now in, I guess, in the States under Capoeira Luanda, uh, Contra Mestre, that is not Brazilian? Either, it doesn't have to be American, any, you know, any other et ethnicity, but I'm curious because, you know, it, I don't know if this is, uh, this has become a realization for me now, is it's like, so Messi Rodrigo came here in, in 1991, I think is when he came, sort of teaching classes in 92 three maybe something like that and as far as he's concerned like that's my route right well i myself and contra master mechido we are the first generation from him from the to be contra mastery right and um and that's a unique thing also like uh from as rodrigo passing that on to to anybody but also it's a very unique thing because around that time also, we're kind of like that first generation Contra Master is kind of coming up from, you know, the the road that our Master is kind of pioneered. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always eager to kind of learn other people's experiences and, uh, and wonder too, like, is that, are there any other uh, either Americans or non-Brazilians that have attained the level of Contra Master in Capoeira Luanda here in the U.S.? Not a Contra Master level, not that I, no. Is that is that for any other reason besides just time and just effort? I mean, yeah, I, I um, you know, I yeah, put in the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Are it's, you working your path? Yeah, because, you know, that's something else that I had to work through myself too because I am Brazilian. I came to U.S. I was an adult, you know, so yeah. I, was, I was 22 almost. In, I got here in June, in August I was 23. But I started up with and all these guys within the group from Boca do Rio and stuff, they had this, they teach in U.S., but they had this experience in Capoeira in Brazil, which I didn't have. Mm -hmm. So I had to chase, I continue to chase the experience. But just like anybody else here in U.S., of course, it is easier for me because I understand the culture. Mm -hmm. I didn't do capoeira when I was living in Brazil, but capoeira was around. Yep. You know, I think capoeira really reflects our identity on a sense, you know? Mm-hmm. We fight to, through the struggle. We have fun with it. We we push each other. We make fun of each other all the time. You know, you you joke, you push, you work, you you 
you desire, you have this passion that just push you. So, I I complete if I really understand the cultural barrier, starting with the language because mm -hmm. I came here I did not speak any English. It, right. It, I had to put time yeah. in to speak, you know, fluently to be able to communicate. Yeah. So the doors can open, so you can well represent yourself. And you know the the position that I put myself as so many of this everybody that's teaching capoeira, we are representing the culture. Either you're Brazilian or not. If you're teaching capoeira, you're representing the culture. And to me, that's the biggest commitment. Mm -hmm. How well can I promote, share, and carry on this culture? And and that's a, a big responsibility. You know that I take it to details, you know, like you, you had a batizado, you had a performance. How do you explain? What are your choice in words when you speak of Capoeira? How well can you represent? What is your posture speaking of it, mm -hmm. or talking? Or, you know, you do, you do a hoda uh, at the park and you st some people are interested in, and you stop and you explain. How do you explain? That's... It. You know, my commitment, my attention to what I'm doing with my work and what I'm passing on, go that detail-oriented. Mm. To me, that is important. Because every time we doing it, we presenting, we, we are representing. Mm -hmm. So being Brazilian, non-Brazilian, I think everybody needs to have that kind of attention right. to what you're doing. If... Cap you chose capoeira to be your profession mm -hmm. and you are taking this yep. to be a huge part of your life. Yeah. So you need so if you're not Brazilian you're going to have to study. Yeah. It's going to push you more. Well, and that you know that runs exactly what you're saying too is uh it's like it's like those expectations, right? Those expectations didn't come from my mastery. They didn't come from your mastery, right? They come from like the the community of capoeira as a whole expects like a certain level of like dissemination of knowledge and how you're gonna how you're gonna do that right yeah i think it goes it, it goes beyond to i think it, you're gonna create your values whatever it is that you're doing according to the way you're brought up mm -hmm. what were your expectations in home when you're little yeah that's deep man you know, it, yeah. it's gonna carry on through your life. Mm -hmm. You know, how 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 did your parents bring you up? What were their expectations out of you? Mm -hmm. As you go to school, as you bring a report card, those are the things that, that sh I think really shapes you up, and is gonna they gonna surface through your life as you decide on a profession, on a trade, on a skill. You know. Mm -hmm. And you bring that. You bring that to whatever it is that you are doing. You know, in our case, it's capoeira. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that come. A lot of my standards and, and my values and what I see. You know, and then you affiliate yourself. You, you know, it's like, a, like a, you attract the energy and... and the values that you believe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and you keep learning from other people, but it, it really, to me, it, it comes that far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another thing, just, uh, you know, just a couple more things kind of before we, we wrap up is, uh, is um, nicknames. How did you come about and when were you given your, your nickname? And what's kind of the story behind that? Because your nickname is Gringo, right? Mm -hmm. Contra Masi Gringo. And it's funny because Masi Rodrigo's nickname, too, is Gringo. Oh, really? Yeah. And he was, uh, I, I believe he's actually born in Chicago. He was born in Chicago. Oh, okay. uh, his father was over know. here doing some uh, medical practice or research. His father's a doctor. Um, but then he was raised in Campinas, you know, mm -hmm. his whole life. But that's kind of like where his nickname come from. And I'm curious, too, like, Always curious about people's apelidos and, mm -hmm. and things like that. What's kind of the story behind yours? Well, it's just because I live here. Yeah. You know, and, and going back. And so I would travel and go 
take a class there, Mestre Dantas. That's where I got the nickname. Oh, okay. And I, here I have to explain all the time because some, some people think that I'm not Brazilian. Uh-huh. Or they think, you know, here the word gringo means something completely different than it means in Brazil. Right. You know, in Brazil, and people are always surprised about that, you know, because I say, well, it doesn't matter where you're from. You can be from China, from Africa, from from Germany, from, I don't know, you name it. If you're in Brazil, you know, Brazilian, you're a gringo, man. Yeah. That's <laughs> all it is to it. You know, he ends there, too. Yeah. And it's, it's a is a joke kind of way, even outside of the world, the capoeira, you know, yep. your family members, your friends, oh, you living in such a place, oh, you're a gringo now. Yeah. You know? It's just as a joke. And, and just going back and forth to train, a guy stuck with the nickname. Yeah. You know, and, and what, what I tell the people that are in Houston is also, you know, first thing is that the nickname sometimes are funny is about the way you look, the way you jingle, the way you do things. But a nickname is never something diminishing in any kind of way. Mm-hmm. It's something about you that your teacher saw and something came recognizable, about, right? Yeah, something that you did. Whatever it is, what is really important is what you make that mm-hmm. nickname be. It's just like your last name for your family, you know. Yeah. Is what that name is going to become. Mm-hmm. What is that name going to represent in the world of Capoeira? Yeah. It's up to the individual to make, you know, it's a choice. Mm-hmm. You want that name to be well known at somebody. Um, with good qualities is somebody that lives the life with capoeira life so if that's your choice you're gonna have to travel you're gonna have to train a lot you're gonna have to Mm -hmm. you know do a lot of things for that name to live in the world of capoeira yeah and it's up to the each each person whatever it is that you want to how far do you want to take yeah yeah and regardless what it is is what you chose Mm -hmm. yeah man you have a you have a long, really cool, unique history with with capoeira, and also have the, you know, the opportunity and privilege to be under such um, renowned guidance from Mestre alone. You know, uh, even myself outside of, I'm not part of you guys' group, but I've been around y'all's culture and Mestre alone so, for so long, going on 25 years now, mm-hmm. that uh, a lot of that bleeds over. You know into like my values as well and even like my just my knowledge of capoeira you know one thing that Matthew Rodrigo always taught us he's like I can't teach you everything you have to go out you have to like you need to accept that you're gonna have many you're gonna have many teachers in capoeira just like in your life you know you'll have your mastery that's my mastery always right yeah but you need to also recognize the value that other people have to to give you knowledge, right, you know, yeah. and some things, some things that some, some masteries will tell you will work for you and some won't. And you need to learn how to accept and, mm-hmm. you know, and that goes in shape. So it's, you know, it's, it's really cool to see also, um, just myself as a capoeirista is like a blend of knowledge from many different people, yeah. you know? Yeah. We all end up, I think, bringing. Yeah from several yeah, sources for sure. and different masters yeah. from a different group from mm-hmm. the, you know you have your home but yeah we we all of us are learning from everybody yeah you know yeah like you said it's like the teacher is always you need to first recognize you're always the student you know yeah i think that's really important yeah it's really really cool um I was really excited to hear about how the foundation started up and and things like that. And I also hope that it gives kind of some some more motivation for people to learn how to, if capoeira is like the path that you want to choose for, mm-hmm. you know, like your your profession, how to kind of go about it in a way that's also sustainable, because that's also really important, you know. I don't think, uh, you know, like you said, the idea is, is uh, how you measure success, right? And everybody, in order to keep the motivation to continue moving forward, you need to taste something of success. Mm -hmm. But you need to align your goals with what's going to help you attain what you feel like is successful. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I hope that just from, from people listening to this also like re spark some motivation and imagination to help continue wherever they're at in Capoeira, that there's always m- like a bigger thing that you can create to help you sustain that, mm-hmm. that level of professionalism. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's a, a really motivating, motivating thing. Um, what are, what's kind of, what are some of the goals going into this new year for the, the Brazilian Arts Foundation? I mean, what do you guys, do you guys have, uh, um, I mean, you're, you're already pretty well established, but what's like the next step for you guys, you know? Uh, we have some new programs that we started that I want to build on it. Mm-hmm. Um, the goal with the organization has always been to create a school. You know, that is the lifetime dream to have a, a, a school with all the academics that mm-hmm. are required, but the the performing, visual, all the arts and activities based on the Brazilian culture. Mm-hmm. So three years ago, we did a strategic plan that we've been following. And we are changing the name of the organization to reflect it, that. For I did a lot of things with the organization. We did a lot of events and a lot of things. And it took me a while to... We went so many different directions, right? Along with Capoeira and, and Portuguese and all this stuff. We had cooking classes. We had movie nights. We we created the Houston Brazilian Festival, which it, we did six years. A lot of different things. And I, it took me a while to understand what is it the most important thing to me mm-hmm. and it's, it's education in our case cultural education mm-hmm. and the goal for this year is to take a harder step to make it that more concrete so I'm, I'm starting a capoeira program that have a curriculum they're going to involve the Portuguese language as a language. Oh, that's great. History as history. Samba, you know, um, all the history of samba, the music of samba, some of the folkloric dance. So I'm trying to be, to really make, start making that dream more concrete. Mm-hmm. You know, we start a program with kids with uh, disabilities that we are now looking for um, grants mm-hmm. to help finance. We are bringing the seniors program to the foundation mm-hmm. also. You know, we're going to continue the collaboration we have with the Wesley Community Center. We continue to, myself and, and instructor Paraná, we've been going there for 10 years. He teaches art, you know, painting, yep. and I do exercise with the seniors. So we're bringing that program also to the foundation. Mm-hmm. And uh, really having curriculums to everything. And on the capoeira aspect, that's another reason why the graduados event the Master Jalon created is so important to me because it's, it's also adding for me to, to help me to build the curriculum. Mm-hmm. You know, because capoeira has... God, if you think of it, it gives so much, right? You have, I always say that uh, to me it's like five programs in one. The music, the language, the dance, the martial arts and the acrobats. There you That's go. That's five. Yeah. Woo, woo, gringo, <laughs> woo, woo. Right? <laughs> now, this is a lot. This is five solid programs yeah. in one. Yeah. But a lot of times we don't have all this in the language sure. w- that that looks like a, a educational institution. Yeah, man, and it's and that's what I'm working on on put it mm-hmm. on our website and create a curriculum for a year that will every year will yeah expand on it and change and come back and redo it. Yeah, for sure. So, it will be a program that ki- we already identified the kids and we started in January and I'm going to be working on this curriculum for September. The goal is in September we have all this published and that is the seed to really start the school. 
Yeah. You know, everything that I'm doing up to this point is with that in mind. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we have a bigger place that can accommodate in more things. And that's the goal for this year. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds amazing, man. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know, I, I appreciate you coming on. I was really excited to, to get to talk to you. And I hope that, I hope again, you know, the idea, the idea of the, of the capoeira connection.com mm-hmm. is also just to kind of like give a voice, uh, and put a lot of content out there just about capoeira in general, you know, in, in English too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's, it's very motivational, uh, and can like re spark, uh, you know, motivation sometimes when, we, when things seem to like settle or, you know, we can form. So I'm, I'm really happy to have you on here. Uh, and it's been great the last 20, 25 years. Um, you know, also, having relationships with, with you guys in your group and Contramaster de Skill and, you know, just like the same as you're saying, like a lot of those guys supported you kind of coming up. Well, a lot of you guys, whether you see it or not, have supported us too, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and it's a great, like, you know, give and take, push and pull thing. Um, yeah, everybody supports each other. And that, you know? that's a unique thing too. In yeah. Up with and that he makes it special, you know, like you guys, the San Antonio group, and um, have always, even before Skilo came mm-hmm. to, of course, mm-hmm. with Skilo, always been so supportive of us in Houston, you know, it's anything that we do, a fast for stuff, we'll let them know and they will come. And mm-hmm. that that's really helpful, you know, it's, yep. it's a community. And the community learn from each other and grow together yeah. to get better, you know, so yeah. it's cool. And it is, it's great. I think it's a great idea that you have. And I think sometimes e- e- people can see Capoeira on a tunnel vision. And some th- I think it's great, too. And I'm glad in order to share my experience of everything that goes around training Capoeira. Yeah, right. You know, that that's something, you know, it's something that I tell the people that come train with us, too. Look, you may be young in Capoeira, but you have life experiences that you got to be able to apply to your training. Yes. And that's something that you bring that's going to teach other people. Mm-hmm. It's going to teach me for sure. Mm-hmm. You know, every student brings something unique that I'm learning from. Sometimes it's patience. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. A very patient student. That's patient with you. Yeah. You know, that uh, I have to look and like, man, I got a little, I got to be a little more calm like that particular person. Yeah. And everybody that come take class with, um, I look and mm, I can learn that from this person or this from that person. Or that, you know. Yeah. So it's good that people hear the story of other people how they came about because they can relate or look like you know and that's the thing about yeah for me i didn't do capoeira in brazil i started late you know sometimes somebody else that see themselves on that situation thinking they can never yeah achieve exactly no it's possible it's Mm -hmm. what do you want yeah what is it that you want go for it yeah yeah and enjoy the process right if you don't enjoy the process, the result is almost pointless. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, all that kind of stuff is like, you know, that's this year and starting this this podcast, those are things that I really want to explore, you know. And and it goes back to of, uh, man, I learned so much from doing this. And that's what I'm excited mm. about is I see so much continued education from doing this, you know. It's great that I can share this with other people and things like that, but, you know, I have to admit, like it, the idea started a little bit selfish because I was like, man, I want to learn more about just the culture and 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 uh, especially like the workings of of capoeira here in the United States and hear from hear from Brazilians and Americans and you know foreigners and things like that. It's like a, just a a growing community of of knowledge and um, so yeah, it's really cool. Um, and, and you see, we 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 go back to something that we talk about. When you do something to serve 
Equanimity. Yeah. All the people. So, right? So you created this to bring people to share their life experience, to inspire other people and all this. And at the end of it, you're getting the most. Yeah. You create this to to bring it all, right? You 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 making this available for the larger community. Right. Bend up that you you putting the work to organize to do this and to do this. But you end up learning much more than you are teaching or that you're presenting. You, yeah. you you getting much more than you can ever give. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm excited to see where it goes, man. Um we uh you know we we're very grateful that you made it down for our, our end of the year holda mm-hmm. too. Yeah. Uh, we have on uh, on Saturday Capoeira Luanda's end of the year holda in San Antonio. San Antonio. So I'm gonna be feeling better today i'm gonna make it down there, there see montagne and those things but again you know thank you very much um i can't wait to also have you on like you know mm-hmm. later on to yeah. have other guests yeah. and stuff My like pleasure. that but thanks a lot yeah anything else you want to mention we're we covered a lot of stuff a lot of good yeah. stuff man man it's, it's just i think my parents you know it's funny funny interesting amazing Sometimes you, you, the people that told you the least is the one that you learn the most. Mm. And my father is one of those people. And um, he told me the list, but he may he he helped me be who I am today in the way I do things and chase things and work hard and you know just pushing us to be there without saying without explaining yeah just with his actions well you want it, you have to go get it mm-hmm. i'm not giving to you i'm not gonna give him a silver platter you're gonna have to do it yeah with that with that responsibility came freedom to choose what is it that i want and how i want to conduct in my life and what it, i want my life to be and that is the best lesson I could ever learn. Mm-hmm. You know, to follow my heart and what is it that makes me happy. And I've been doing that since I was 14, 15, when I got my first job in Brazil. You know, working all day and going to high school at night to pay for that high school. That's mm-hmm. what he made us do. and was the best thing he could ever do because he shaped me in, in, in the way that I'm proud of what I do and who I am and what he 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 put in my head, you know. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you don't completely agree with the ways things are done, but it takes a while to understand yeah. why they were done and how they affect you, mm-hmm. you know. And I, I'm really grateful. That is who I learned the most. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know your community around you sees that also, you know, like one hundred percent. It's another reason why I really wanted to have you on and and talk about that kind of stuff. And um, you know, there's a lot of people also close to you that I I really want to have on the podcast too and share other things to kind of like connect all these all these things together. You know, a skill going to mess too, and mm-hmm. and one day if I'm lucky, I corner message alone. <laughs> <laughs> Right, I'm gonna have to cool. run around, yeah, carry my laptop Chase and the microphone. Yeah. Yeah, 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 cool. But yeah. uh, you know, again, we'll wrap this up. But uh, you know, thank you so much for taking your time to to be here, and you know, we wish you well in this new year. Keep doing what you're doing, man. Yeah. We want to see, uh, you know, what what more comes out of the Brazilian Arts Foundation. Thank um, you. Last thing, website. Where can we see information about that and what you have going on? BrazilianArts.org. Great. Uh, Every program, everything that we do is there. Also, our social media channels, you know, Brazilian Arts Foundation, Facebook, Instagram is BAF Houston. Okay. On YouTube, there's a lot of videos, too. And, uh, cool. you know, stay tuned. Um, like us there, and you see everything that we are going on, All that right. we, is going on in Houston. Sounds good, man. All right. Well, again, thanks very much. Thank you. Guys, thanks for listening. Till next time.